Hello and welcome back to Climatic, where we meet the innovators who are reducing Asia's carbon footprint, the entrepreneurs who are making the Asia Pacific more resilient to climate change, and the investors and corporate leaders who are partnering with startups for impact. Today's episode, the Electric Vehicle Solutions Showcase. Our analysts have identified three of Asia's most intriguing up and coming electric mobility startups. I'm going to invite each of them to pitch one at a time. Then, our panel of top electric mobility investors will share what they like, their concerns, and whether they're interested in taking the deal further. For the entrepreneurs watching, this showcase provides you with an inside peek into the type of conversations that investors would normally have behind closed doors. What do they like about each pitch? And probably more interesting, why do certain companies get a warm reception while others get that dreaded, let's keep in touch email? Climatic is giving you, our audience, a unique opportunity to be a fly on the wall for conversations that founders don't normally get to hear. We know that founding a startup is hard. Leaving a stable job to chase a dream is hard. Engineering new solutions is hard. And raising money from investors, also hard. We want to see more entrepreneurship in climate impact technologies. We hope that providing this opportunity to see how VC investors really think that we're giving founders valuable insight that will help them grow and succeed. Now let's get started and meet our investors. Navaruna Traya is a senior investment analyst with Plug and Play, one of the world's largest early stage investors. Navarun has a mechanical engineering background and gets excited about anything deep tech. Before Plug and Play, he spent time as a production engineer at Hyundai. Sophia Nador is a managing partner at BP Ventures, where she is responsible for the Asia Pacific and Middle Eastern markets. She's focused on tech-led business models that accelerate the transition to net zero. In her spare time, Sophia enjoys exploring the British countryside in her electric car. Coy Navarro is an investment associate with ADB Ventures, where he sources and manages clean tech deals for climate impact. He's also a shareholder in two electric vehicle companies in the Philippines. And finally, Doug Parker is a deep tech entrepreneur turned venture partner with Wavemaker Partners. He built and exited Newtonomy, one of the very few successful self-driving car companies. Doug now invests in clean tech, including green energy, water, and waste technologies, and of course, electric mobility. Thanks to the panel for joining our program. Now it's time to meet our first startup. Most of today's electric vehicles use lithium ion batteries, but the lithium supply chain has serious constraints. In addition, the world is still trying to figure out the best way to dispose of spent batteries. Singapore registered Green Lion recycles those batteries. They claim that their solution is cleaner, faster, and four times more profitable than the next best approach. And their process results in pure battery-ready cathode material. CEO Leon Ferrant is here to represent Green Lion. Leon, tell us more. To support the energy transition, we're going to need a gigabit ton of batteries. So what Elon Musk says, and the problem is even larger. Within the next five years, we're going to have more, more demand and supply for lithium ion batteries. But the sad reality is 95% of all these batteries go straight into landfill. 5% are recycled, and of that 5%, only two, -thir two thirds of that is recycled in China. So the rest of the world, we're doing a dismal job. Green Lion is the, the circular economy solution for lithium ion batteries. We're a hardware deep tech company which uses a novel form of hydrometallurgy to fully rejuvenate lithium ion batteries. Our machine is at commercial scale and in, um, and, and in production. We sold five of our GLMC1 machines, which can handle two metric tons per day of spent lithium ion batteries. Comes in, our input is in the form of black mass, crushed lithium ion batteries, the ferrous material. And um, within 24 hours, we can handle the equivalent of 56,000 iPhone 8 batteries. Um, it goes through our process and we produce battery ready cathode material as an output at pure levels. 99.9% .9 pure, up to 99.9% .9 purity. These, uh, this cathode material can be reused straight back in batteries. Our process is closed loop, so it's greener. 
than anything on the market. It has eight times less carbon footprint than our current competitors. Um, but of course, we're also stopping the reliance on mining and the contribution to landfill. It's up to 10 times faster than current processes because we're cutting out or disrupting the supply chain whereby that black mass produced by recyclers currently needs to go to Japan, South Korea or China for further refinement, um, taking up to 90 days. The process uh, solves the biggest problem of all, which is that lithium ion battery pro uh, recycling is not commercially viable. The reason why this is not viable is that they're producing what's called black mass and it only fetches two to five thousand dollars per metric ton. Our process allows them to produce battery grade cathode material, which is much more than five times more valuable. In fact, it can fetch up to thirty nine thousand dollars per ton. We are, um, as said, we're, we're already commercializing this product and, um, and building these machines in the United States and distributing. We've sold machines in the US and in Asia. Um, and compared to the competition, it is the only technology that takes in all lithium ion battery types, every chemistry without sorting, making it far more efficient for the battery recyclers we take in all five popular battery chemistries and we have another solution, another machine called the GLLFP1, which takes in LFP batteries and handles that, that tricky phosphate um, compound which, which is, is contained. We've got a great team, myself uh, being an energy industry uh, Lifer, I've been around. I've been in the industry for 15 years. Most recently, leading as CEO, uh, mid-sized companies. Um, and my co-founder, Dr. Reza Katal, worked on, in lithium-ion battery recycling for 10 years, amongst getting his masters in chemical engineering, his masters in environmental science sciences, and of course his PhD from NUS. Um, and we have a great team here in Singapore. Small team but 50% PhDs and uh, the rest are, of course, engineers to build our large hardware. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, I look forward to meeting you all shortly. Thanks, Leon. Very interesting pitch and quite technical. Let's see what our panel thought. Koi, would you like to jump in first? I really think what they're doing is essential um, because like, there have been conversations about second life Use, use cases for batteries, et cetera, but never really about um, recycling. And I think it's going to be an emerging issue very soon um, because of landfills, et cetera. I, I think they have a fundamental sort of um, technology or innovation in the process itself, which simplifies the process and reduces the, I guess, the processing time and also gives out um, useful cathodes, like um, th that's almost battery ready. So I think that's interesting. Plus the fact that they don't need to sort is I think an important piece because um, like if you look at Asia, uh, most of the countries don't really do sorting very well. And so if you avoid that step and are is able to mitigate that, then that's, um, that simplifies the process basically. But I guess a challenge for scalability is if, if you, if I remember correctly, they're in Singapore, and they're focused on building a plant in North America. I think in both countries, policy about um, disposal of lithium ion batteries is somehow well formulated and uh, well implemented. So I think it's those two things. Like, but if you look at other countries in, in, in Southeast Asia, maybe China uh, fits into that bucket. Um, but other countries, you may struggle with um, feedstock, the inputs to the recycling. And that, I guess, is the big question when it comes to its impact in Southeast Asian countries. Um, but generally, I, I, I love the tech. Uh, I think it's, it's really essential that we, we get around this. Um, Koi, I, I actually asked Leon the same question because I did have a, a, a question around why focus on Asia or the U.S. and building their first facility. And he mm -hmm. said to me that actually they're looking at Europe as one, of, as one of their key focus areas. And I think that's actually a pretty smart move because, as you say, there's, there's a lot of feedstock available and there is a big 
openness and willingness to develop sustainable battery recycling. Because again, if you if you want to be able to uh, ensure that you've got uh, you've got a full value chain, and if you don't have the raw materials, what what better way to, to, to encourage that uh, full circularity by having sustainable battery recycling facilities? And so, I think it's quite interesting. I like the fact that they're essentially a bolt on to a manufacturing process. Um, and so, it's uh, I, I, I'm actually. Pretty, um, pretty bullish about this company. I think there's lots of opportunities there, and it's and they're in the right space. I mean, they're talking about twenty four billion dollar market size uh, in a couple of years' time, and so I think they're onto something. Right. Yeah. I, I think um, I'm also pretty impressed by their technology. So, going back into their core technology, I mean, if we are talking about let's say uh, pyro or hydro metallurgical recovery processes, um, one, they're very energy intensive. And then two, uh, you need uh, you need to sort of tackle a lot of toxic gases and waste products that are actually um, sort of recaptured during the process and they're produced during the process. Now for um, Green Lion, uh, I think their process is way more efficient. And uh, they mentioned about uh, co- co-precipitation method um, in terms of their IP, uh, basically uh, also going into the part where they're not dealing with black mass itself, rather they are going towards directly reusable battery grade cathode material like um, Koi mentioned. So I think that makes it very efficient. And um, also, I think this is to do with drawing on the um, expertise of the team. So we have noticed that on the technical side, they're very strong. Their CTO is um, a PhD uh, who has spent about about 15 plus years in the space. So I think um, in that sense, they have a very strong sort of moat there. And um, again, I mean, market-wise, obviously, um, right now, less than about 5% of the lithium-ion batteries are being recycled, even if it's like manual recycling process to begin with. And um, in India, uh, most of it goes to landfill. So I think Asia-wise, if we're talking about Asia, um, China, Korea, and Japan, they sort of stand out in terms of battery recycling. India is nowhere close, but then the volume at which batteries are being sold in India, it's almost comparable to any of these other economies. So I think um, can be very effective down the line when it comes to uh, the Indian economy. Uh, I have some concerns around how they will really differentiate themselves. Um, I feel like technology may not be enough to defend yourself in this space. I think there's a lot of startups focused on lithium battery recycling and how you differentiate your method and get it adopted is going to be a real challenge. Um, I also have some, some concerns that this may be early in the game. Uh, when most cars are electric, this will be a $100 billion market. Uh, today, we're just starting to convert and those cars are still on the road. So how we actually get the feedstock to make this a really large business is, is I think it may be just too early. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for your thoughts. Now, if this were a real investment process, the next step would be to set up an informational meeting to hear the story straight from the founder and to dig deeper into some of the key areas. But of course, VCs get many proposals and don't accept meetings with every startup. So let me ask you, based on everything you've heard, are you interested in talking further with Green Lion? Okay, well, I'm not a battery technology expert, so what I can offer Leon is it's probably not worth it talking to me as yet, but I'll make sure that I, I make the intro to our battery technology uh, experts uh, to, to be able to have a discussion around uh, product fit within some of the uh, bigger projects that we're looking at as well. So I'd be delighted to make that intro for him. Okay, great. So a referral to your battery specialist. Thanks, Sophia. How about you, Doug? I think I'd pass at this point. I think it's interesting technology. I think it's a huge market in the future. I just think it might be too early for us. Okay, I think that's an interesting observation. For you, the market is still too early. You believe the feedstock isn't there yet, and you'd prefer to keep in touch and see more traction before engaging in a conversation. And Koi, what about you? Yeah, I'm open to have a call with them, but I'd be curious who will be the lead investor if they're fundraising. Like, and we definitely rely on that lead. I mean, we don't have in-house sort of deep tech experience in the battery space. So we would need to rely on on sort of a lead investor to provide that sort of understanding for us. Um, so yeah, I, I think this one open because of our mandate, which is, you know, climate, you know, um, you know, mitigation and resilience. I think this is key. 
But again, uh, to Doug's point, right? Um, there are a lot of unknowns, and we want to tread more carefully here. But definitely, we'll take a call with them. Okay, great. Thanks, Koi. So that's a yes. And Avarun, what do you think? For us, I think it's really important that we have valuation in terms of um, industry adoption. So uh, if that is validated, yes, there is a high potential that we can go ahead and sort of look into the space and invest. But uh, again, I mean, um, whether as efficient or not, we have seen multiple startups come up in the sector. And um, to be very fair, we are certainly comparing competitors even from the Indian market at this point. So yeah, um, I think in summary, we'd definitely love to have further discussions with uh, Greenline. All right, that's a yes from Plug and Play as well. Let me bring Leon back. Leon, I know you're confident Green Lion has the best battery recycling tech on the market today. It sounded to me like our panel wanted to agree, but they were concerned about market readiness and competition. What's your reaction to that? Uh, regarding competitors, I mean, we're, we're very aware of our competitors and what they're doing, and um, certainly we, we have a jump start. However, we're not naive to the fact that, you know, most of our competitors are more highly capitalized than us and the race is on and they're, they've, they're full of smart people and, uh, and resources. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's like with many novel technologies, we need to make sure that we protect it, that we build it and we distribute it broadly. Um, to, to make sure we stay in front. I think that it is, um, it would be hard to, for a, an investor that has not, you know, done deep tech and large hardware projects like this to feel as comfortable with us and be as supportive as one that, you know, knows the trials and tribulations of building a, a you know, machine the size of a house and having to reproduce it at mass. So we've got the privilege of, of being able to speak to many investors. Um, I just came back from a trip to, to California and spent a lot of time with investors there. Um, and, you know, all of the things that we heard today are, are, are echoed in, in, in some of their responses. People have different positions on this. Um, deep tech, novel, novel tech, and especially hardware, is very uh, scary and it's um, and it's risky. So you know, there's only a select few that have the comfort level um, to to sort of support companies like ours. Um, and then there's even a smaller smaller group of people that are, are passionate about green and clean tech and changing the world from an environmental perspective. Um, so that that large large group of potential investors, you know, become smaller quickly. Strategic investors that understand deep tech and hardware are worth their weight in gold for a company like ours. They know what we're going through. They know how to build things. They know how to connect you. They have have networks in in the correct places, uh, not just money. Okay, thanks, Leon. One of the key challenges of working in developing markets is bringing new technologies from developed markets into the region. Asia Pacific as a whole is a large market, but within the region, the countries are quite fragmented. Every startup needs to decide on their best beachhead. That may be a function of the size of the adjustable market, the labor costs, or in this case, the availability of feedstock. Hesitation due to market assumptions is a tough hurdle to overcome. No one can tell the future, so it's hard to convince an investor that their perspective is too conservative or possibly uninformed. I think the best thing for entrepreneurs to do in this case is to continue to execute and prove the investor wrong via the company's traction. As an investor, I love to be proven wrong when that means I have an opportunity to invest in a company with a proven growth trajectory. Next on the Climatic Electric Vehicle Solution Showcase, Lithium Power. New Delhi-based Lithium Power has built an intelligent energy delivery ecosystem solution for electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers. It includes a battery management system, infrastructure for charging and battery swapping, real-time data analytics, and software for drivers and fleet operators. Co-founder Shikar Bide is here to share more about Lithium Power. Let's hear from Shikar. And then let's see what our panel of VC investors thinks about Lithium Power's investability and potential to scale. Hello everyone, I am Chandra Shekhar from Lithium Power. We are India's electric vehicle ecosystem with charging solutions as a hook. By 2030, we have a vision to provide energy 
for a million electric vehicles covering about 1.5 billion kilometers on a monthly basis, preventing 0.2 million tons of carbon dioxide emission, thereby saving 45 million liters of fossil fuel fuel. We are committed towards making the dream of EV only India by 2030 a reality. We provide intelligent energy delivery infrastructure for low to medium power electric vehicles. This has uh, connected technical products like battery management systems, shared infrastructure for electric vehicle charging and battery swapping, software for uh, different uh, users of the ecosystem like uh, drivers, supervisors, fleet operators, and real time data analytics. We address two problems. First is on the inadequate delivery infrastructure. Think of it as gas stations for electric vehicles. Our solution is open shared uh, network for uh, charging and battery shopping for electric two wheelers and three wheelers. The second problem is lack of uh, real time data exchange across EV entities and their products. This actually results in low utilization of uh, deployed assets. Our solution is an intelligent energy platform that uh, connects the whole ecosystem together and this is driven by a smart battery management system. Since uh, the product has been designed and developed by us, we own the intellectual property and uh, this makes it completely configurable and easy to integrate with other components, thereby providing better control. We have an ecosystem approach, so the hardware, embedded, communication, software, data analytics, all is designed and developed in-house and uh, we own it. We have more than a dozen patents filed on the engineering aspects and the first uh, patent was already granted in July 21 this year. We are currently uh, uh, under testing phases with uh, three of the top 10 auto OEMs in the country. One large battery pack uh, manufacturer, uh, which is a multi-billion dollar listed entity, has already placed an order on us last month. We have about 30 customers across electric vehicle OEMs, battery manufacturers and e-commerce players. We have started a European office two quarters back and we have already got three pilot customers evaluating our products. Pre-COVID, our uh, ARR was about $1.1 million that obviously got impacted but uh, we are back with a bang and now growing at 35% month on month. We already have 5,000 VMS deployed uh, which has covered more than 5 million kilometers. Our electric vehicle fleet is active in six locations in the Delhi NCR region across e-commerce groups. In the next uh, five years, we intend to cover at least half a million electric uh, vehicles doing daily deliveries for e-commerce players. Uh, this is a total addressable market of about $50 billion annually. Uh, the government is already, uh, uh, has already implemented measures to support this. They have announced supply-side incentives and demand-side subsidies. State nodal agencies have already been appointed. EV policies have been uh, notified and first few tenders have been rolled out. We believe that the future is going to be simply electric and we at Lithium Power are totally poised to take advantage of this. Thank you. Thanks, Shukar. Now let's go to our panel for reactions. Sophia, why don't you lead us off? As you know, we've just invested in a four-wheel EV only ride hail business in India, uh, Blue Smart. And if you imagine as more and more of the ICE cars convert to EVs, you're going to, there's much more demand on the grid. And also there's lots of opportunities to build incremental offers on, uh, on top of, uh, on top of just charging services. So BMS, be it, be it small two or three wheelers, or even eventually into four wheelers is important and being able to have, have uh, tough software uh, solutions that can, can help us convert those to offers are, are pretty critical, um, not just to help us with the managing the peak load that a lot of these vehicles are going to are going to impress on the, the utility grid system in, in India, but also be able to then offer a new products and services at the charging hubs or at the gas stations or at the workshops. So it's a it's a big area in India and um, no one, frankly, in my view, has cracked it yet, but it's it's wide open space. Just, just to jump in, right? So I think, um, again, um, it, it is quite open in the sense that um, there are competitors in the market. So for example, if you look at Ola Electric or Aether, they have their own um, BMS. However, if you look at the smaller OEMs, they certainly need the support in terms of someone else coming in and helping them with the BMS. And then I think uh, their approach towards um, a, a sort of 
targeting the battery manufacturers, smaller OEMs, and e-commerce clients as an ecosystem. I think um, this really works in their favor. And uh, if we are looking into sort of where they are targeting, so that's basically like the uh, the fleet for last mile delivery, both B2C and B2B uh, e-commerce, we have seen that grow. We have seen Uran grow recently in India. And then in terms of um, last mile logistics and delivery, we have seen the likes of delivery become unicorn. And then Dunzo is probably at around like growth stage at this point as well. So essentially they are in a space where they are going more for an ecosystem play. So rather than the BMS being the core of things, um, they are, they're more concerned about building up the ecosystem, which works in their favor, I would say. But I would question, I would question one thing. I mean, they've been around since 2016 and, and they've not had significant market traction as yet. So I really want to dig in into the technology a bit to see what, what the issue is moving from POCs and pilots to sustainable revenue. And, and are there any sort of business development hurdles? Are they missing some capability in-house which can help them convert what seems to be successful POCs and pilots into a sustainable business long-term? Because, I mean, they've been in operation now in around five, six years and the marketplace is going to grow pretty quickly in the next two or three? Maybe I can share some, some of my reservations. So small to medium-sized OEM manufacturers would be the target market. And I think there are a lot of those in Southeast Asia as well, outside of India. Because again, like uh, high quality batteries is an issue. Um, if most of the um, OEMs in that country primarily assemble sort of completely knock down imports from China or India. So I think there's a huge market there. But if, if you think about like medium term, longer term, how defensible really would that initial market share be, right? Because um, all, all vehicles will eventually um, need to be replaced. And the one that dictates what battery gets installed in those replacements would be the OEMs, right? If you're reliant on the OEM to sort of give you a, a channel into a particular market, then you'll be squeezed out uh, margin wise, potentially. I guess the, the real question is, even if you successfully do a land grab by working with smaller sort of OEMs, right, would that ultimately be defensible if larger OEMs start knocking on the door with their own battery solution or sort of, um, you know, uh, companies that have control over that consumer relationship starts thinking about increasing their margins and reverse integrating a lot of these um, value chains. So that is sort of gives me pause um, with, uh, with lithium power. Doug, I know you have a strong personal interest in battery management. What are your thoughts on lithium power? Yeah, so uh, full disclosure, I've invested it in an Indian BMS company. I think it's a very interesting niche. Between besides just the look and feel, it's the actual how the bicycle rides or drives is is very much going to be dictated by the BMS. And so I think it's a really important thing for the makers to get right. Uh, it is a challenging space because a lot of battery suppliers supply BMS as well. Um, a lot of bike makers or, or car makers realize that BMS is so critical to the experience. Uh, they want to have control of that themselves. So I think it's a, it's a challenging space to, to find your niche. Okay, so that brings us to the big question. Based on what you've heard so far, do you have an appetite to learn more? Did lithium power intrigue you enough for you to schedule that 30 minute intro call? Yeah, I mean, we have been looking into the Indian market and we haven't haven't made any investments so far, especially in the mobility space. But concern here would be, you know, their core IP is still the BMS. So for us, I think the core IP really matters. And then in terms of com competition, I think it's a very tough space uh, for them to crack. So I would say that we'll be open to sort of keep the discussion going. But for us to actually invest in that space with that kind of competition coming in, um, that is a huge uncertainty there, I would say. So some reservations around competition. Sophia, how about you? Well, okay, so the two, three wheeler space is wide open for, for more and more venturing. And, and I would say that BPs and Castrol's focus will be in the Indian market more downstream, per se. Yeah, into the offer and into the battery swapping aspect of it. So more business model, less, well, I would say, hard tech or deep tech. Uh, so I would say I'd, I'd pass on this, but I'd, I'd, I'd keep close to, to the founders and the founding team. Because you, you never know in terms of how these collaborations uh, pan out in the next uh, six to 12 months. It's, it's quite an active market right now. 
interesting enough to keep in touch, but they need a little bit more traction. Doug, what do you think? I'd have to pass given my competing investment, but wish them luck. It's a neat space. Fair enough. You've already made your bet in this space. And Koi, what do you think? Yeah, for me, it's a, it's a pass. Uh, I think uh, one reason is we're already invested in an OEM that does have its own you know, battery management solution. Um, and also, I, I still maintain my reservations about the defensibility of whatever initial market you, you get um, by providing battery swapping or a BMS. Um, but I, I, you know, I keep track of them and monitor them, but at this point, um, I, I'd pass. It sounds like this panel has quite a few reservations. But here's the thing, when it comes to early stage investing, for every unicorn, there are a handful of investors kicking themselves for passing on that deal. Shakar, this was a tough panel for you, but you also got a chance to peek behind the climatic curtain. Some of these judges considered you one of the most intriguing up and coming EV startups in Asia. What do you make of their hesitation? We didn't start as a BMS company. We started as an energy delivery company, you know, with the initial focus on battery swapping. And whatever was required to get that into action, we started doing. So yes, BMS is at the core. And especially if you are running a battery swapping solution, then a smart connected BMS is a prerequisite, you know, because you need to understand what is going on in the battery, how much energy is left every second of its operation. And that actually helps you do uh, optimized uh, battery swapping operations. Now, the thing I wanted to add is, uh, you know, we are not just, we are not just into battery management systems. We have other smart connected components as well. Okay. And uh, we have actually rolled out a EV charging and a battery swapping network, which is again an open shared ecosystem. Okay. So it is not like uh, a proprietary for uh, some of the other players. Okay. So we have actually onboarded about uh, 30 odd partners. This is across the electric vehicle OEMs and the battery pack manufacturers. And by virtue of using our smart connected products, they automatically come onto our network. Okay. So even though there might be you know, multiple players who are trying to uh, expand in this space, uh, very few people, you know, I would say that probably we are the only one who has an ecosystem approach. So right from the hardware to embedded to software to data analytics, and right from the uh, in engineering products to the charging and energy delivery network, you know, you know we, we have tried to ensure that we are always connected to the ecosystem and uh, we don't have any exclusive partnerships. Now, I think one of the uh, comments was that uh, this is a very difficult market to be in and that is correct, right? But once you have the correct partnerships, and once you understand what drives what part of the ecosystem, then it is fairly uh, smooth riding. Okay. So so far, you know, we have worked across the ecosystem, right, from the EV OEMs to battery pack manufacturers to fleet operators. Okay, and uh, you know, providing solutions which they want. And this is something which we have uh, tried doing, and which we have fine tuned, and which we have uh, sharpened our offerings for the last three years. It is not just the hardware. Okay, hardware is easy to copy. The core part is the embedded algorithms inside, the data that we have collected. And this is all market data. We have billions of records of data. Okay, this is individual cell voltages, current being drawn, capacity left, location parameters, latitude, longitude, some you know vehicle information, driver information. You now aggregating to so, so these are billions of records and aggregating to like. 100 plus billions of data points. Now, this is something which nobody can copy, right? We understand the batteries and the utilization of batteries, the decay and uh, degeneration of batteries over its lifetime, like nobody's business. We had a conscious uh, decision taken up front. We wanted to work with smaller players because they were more agile. They were more open to making changes to their uh, products or services or the way they operate. And again, you know, only a smaller players is not our target segment. We, uh, we work across the value chain. So in fact, uh, one of the top two battery pack manufacturers, which is a listed entity and which is a billion dollar, billions of dollars of market cap has already placed an order on us in the month of August. And last week, you know, we had a, uh, they had visited our premises and they have tripled the initial order. 
right? So this would not happen, you know, if they didn't like our products. Okay. So we are at that point in time where, you know, we have spent considerable amount of time and efforts in fine tuning our products and ensuring that they are market ready for larger players. Okay, great. Thank you, Shikhar. One of the biggest challenges for a founder as they embark on the fundraising journey is how do they distill years of operations into a 15 page presentation or a three minute video. This is certainly true for Lithium Power. You want to make sure that the VC not only understands what you do, but also provide them with enough data points to demonstrate your expertise and your traction. And then the next big question is, which VC do I speak to? In Shakar's case, he knew that he was working on a solution that was highly technical, and the people with the most knowledge of this technology would be working in large corporations who are already operating in a similar space. As a founder, you should also analyze your addressable market in terms of investors. You want to spend your time discussing growth potential rather than explaining the basics of your technology. And one final note, the fundraising process is similar to a sales process. You have to find the right fit with a partner and a fund, then keep them interested through to the final diligence and the contract signing. In this case, Shakar only received one potential meeting out of three investors. To this, I would say, keep in mind, this is par for the course. Each VC has a different worldview. Just make sure you're targeting the proper investors and keep on going. Fundraising is a full-time job. Thailand's e-tran makes an electric motorbike boasting top speeds of 120 kilometers per hour and battery capacity of 180 kilometers per charge. And the battery charges in just four hours. The company has sold 500 bikes and made available 2,000 as rentals, with the goal of selling 10,000 units by the end of 2022. Saranan Chuchat, or more fondly referred to as Earth, is here to share more. Earth, take it away. Hi, my name is Earth, CEO from eTran Thailand. At eTran, we want to be the cleanest mobility company, offers the best designs, experience, and technology to regenerate a healthier environment and better living for everyone. The slow adoption of EVs cause climate change impact to all of us. How can we make it possible and faster for Southeast Asia? In 2022, we want to be the ESG leader in Thailand e-bike industry by achieving 10,000 units or 25% of market share, plus 20,000 tons of carbon reduction, and empower 10,000 of riders to be the climate leader. We have inclusive e-bike ecosystem to launch. We have three different models. One is for logistics, one is for public transportation, and one is for consumer. And we also have the power station to make the user come to swap at our station anytime and also e-tron application. This year, we're launching e-tron Myla that designed for logistic and last mile delivery purpose. We can go faster to 100 km per hour. We can go longest as 180 km per charge. And we build for the tough set. We can put more uh, goods on the bed up to 150 kilograms. After CWA crossing in the mid of 21, we can produce up to 1,000 units per month at Summit Auto Body, one of the most trusted, largest automotive manufacturing in regional. Now, we are the fastest growth company in Thailand, number one in market, 2,000 units to rent and 500 units to buy. Our rental business is simple, it's created and accessible for all. It starts from 5 US dollar per day and it's cheaper than IC motorcycle about 40%. We are building 100 of swapping stations that run by 100% renewable energy. Every kilometer of e-tron, we reduce 45 grams of CO2 every kilometer or 0.8 tons per year. And we have ambition to reach 1 million tons of CO2 every year by 2025. Not just the sustainability, we care about women. Our bike can, can ride with women and we will set up our goal to have 50% of our women leader in our company, including board director, management team, and production lines. Our co-founder are from R&D. Now we're expanding on more finance, operation, and after-sales service. So our next step, we will build up e-tron ecosystem 2.0. We will have more e-tron architecture products, battery manufacturing, and also e-tron lab. 
So to be the leader in this market, we can must be the ESG leader. Thank you, everyone. Okay, great. Thanks, sir. That's really interesting. Let's bring our panel back. Koi, what are your thoughts on ETRAN? One thing we look for, at least in ADV Ventures, when you when we look at EVs is um, vehicles that are designed for purpose. And when you look at how they designed the, the Myra scooter, for example, it's designed to carry 150 kg of cargo. You're able to sit on it comfortably. And why that matters to us, like if you're an e-logistics company and it's picking up because of COVID, as, as everyone knows, right? Um, the cost of mobility is key. And the amount of revenue you can extract per trip is also key. So if you're able to sort of offer up a solution that enables a, an e-commerce um, delivery driver to earn a higher revenue per trip and given the lower maintenance costs in OPEX theoretically of EVs over ICE vehicles, um, that will give them higher net income. I, I kind of like the, the fact that it's designed for purpose. I also like the fact that it's swapping because uptime is essential for last mile logistics. So that's sort of my immediate impression on e-tran, um, but you know, I uh, would, would love to hear what others think. I think I, I completely agree with Koi. Like design for purpose is certainly something which is really um, important. But uh, I also like the fact that it's efficiently priced. So I think it's uh, on a renting basis, it's $5 per day. If we compare like a pure ownership, it's $2,000 for ownership. So which is very similar to some of the other OEMs in the EV two-wheeler sector coming up in India as well. So Going by that, and then the subscription is just $22. So if we compare the monthly subscription for the battery to what they would spend on uh, internal combustion engine for fuel, I think it's very efficient in terms of the pricing as well. Um, I agree with both of you. I, I would say, though, that uh, because it's uh, they're claiming quite a fast speed, a max speed, and given they're carrying 150 kilo of load, I would still want to see a little bit more around the safety features that are built into the bike. Um, it's one thing that we are quite concerned about or cautious about investing in this space is ensuring uh, riders and pedestrians and the general public are kept safe, uh, even though we know that this is such an important form of transport, especially in busy streets. Doug, you've invested in motorbike OEMs. What do you think of eTran? Uh, I'm a big, big fan of electric vehicles. Had one of the first electric vehicles in Singapore. I'm also an avid motorcycle rider, so really excited to see all of the developments in the electric motor motorcycle space. I'm concerned about the defendability of the space. It seems like there's lots and lots of motorcycle uh, developers or motorcycle OEMs springing up. And so I like the fact that they're early, they're already out on the streets, and that they're developing a swappable battery network. I feel like that's one of the key ways to defend your space. It encourages more people to buy your cycle if they can keep riding all day. I also think there's a strong element around brand. One of the uh, EV companies that we've invested in in Vietnam has a very strong uh, brand around ridership and a very strong community. And so I think that will help some of these electric motorcycle uh, makers stand out versus their competitors. But are they really addressing a big enough market? Right. So I think that was one of my first questions to the team as well. Uh, I saw that they were founded back in 2015. And when we were discussing about, uh, you know, the timeline for product development, they mentioned that uh, the next year was pretty much spent sort of finding the product market fit. And at this point, I believe 2,500 units are out in market and the target is to have 1,000 units um, out per month. Now, um, I feel that on that end, the speed has been a bit slow considering that there has been significant amount of time in between from product market fit to actual sort of production and going out in the market. And considering we have a few different players coming up in the Southeast Asian market, and just to be reminded, um, in Southeast Asia, it's very likely that if a startup is present in one country, they will expand to the other countries as well. All right. So do you really think they can defend the market? What happens when the big Japanese motorbike OEMs ramp up their competition? Okay, so I mean, I'm, I'm part of BP and we have lots of gas stations and workshops, which can be perfect 
swapping stations for these for these offers. And I do think that their their focus on it on a last mile logistics aspect is probably more interesting because that's how you can help increase utilization of the of the assets, and you can ensure that basically that issue of of having to deal with getting the food or the goods or services delivered to the end consumer, you can more or less outsource that to a separate company, and that helps as well in ensuring as well a sustainable revenue for the bike owner so the asset owner but also the actual uh, owner of the platform of the aggregator whatever is doing the transfer i think that's the probably the way that small insurance can 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 maybe block against the incumbents coming in because the incumbents coming in obviously have scale etc but if you can at least let's say tie up your local neighborhood tie up your local city streets or city block then that might make it harder for even large in, large incumbents to come in uh, so I, I, so i do think etran has a has has potential but i if i were them i'd focus on, on the last mile sector okay great motorbike design and manufacturing is definitely an interesting category but there's a lot of startup activity so investors what do you think is etran worth a deeper look absolutely so i think on our part um, being very transparent, uh, we have already invested into um, one competing startup in the region. So in that sense, um, it does not uh, probably make sense for us to um, engage as an investor, but very excited to see what comes for them, um, especially because um, when it comes to small and medium businesses and last mile delivery, it's always a big task for them to actually take care of that. So if that is something which is um, sort of made seamless, that'll be very exciting. So. Looking forward to what comes for them next. Okay, so you probably can't invest, but you can see that this is an interesting company regardless. Koi, do you agree? No, absolutely. Um, I'd love to sort of speak with them and learn more about you know their traction, their experience in both the, the passenger and the cargo space. I, we also did an investment in a Vietnamese company, uh, which in a very similar space. But that said, like, I'm not really sure how things will evolve because the thing about uh, Southeast Asia is very different local policies, very different markets, and you don't quite know whether you know it's so easy to expand regionally. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's interesting enough for us to you know maybe take a 30-minute call with them. Okay, great. You have prior investments in this space and are looking to do more. Sophia, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to have a 30-minute call with uh, Sarana. I, I mean, we haven't invested in the two, two, three wheeler spaces yet, and Castro and BP were looking actively in this area to venture in. We've just made a, a venture announcement uh, in the four wheel space in India, and so we, I'm sure, we'd be able to offer some suggestions as well as to how to scale up, whether they focus on the swapping element or they keep focus on the the whole package. Thanks, Sophia. Very encouraging. Last but not least, Doug Parker. Doug, is there room in your portfolio to consider another e-motorbike OEM? Yeah, absolutely. Would love to learn more. I think it's a very important space. It's very large and there's going to be some big winners in the space. We, we have invested in Vietnamese two-wheelers. We've invested in some other uh, motorcycle technology, but would, would love to learn more about this opportunity as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Doug. Let me invite Earth back. Earth, that was all very positive. There's been so much entrepreneurship and investment in e-motorbike manufacturing across Asia that I thought investors might actually be losing their appetite. But that's obviously not true. What do you think of what the panel had to say? I like how, how they talk about our uh, uh, speed of development. Um, we spend about five to six years till this stage. And, and I, I think it could, could be faster, but, but the, the, the point that takes us slow is since the 2015 it's 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 early and um there's a, a lot of policy issue um a lot of fundraising issue whereas um hardware startup or ev startup in in this regional is quite tough <laughs> um i think investors are not common in in uh in in software uh in in hardware and and we spend like five years to five series is which <laughs> super slow and and i think second 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 takeaway that i i really like it it's um what, how they suggest us to focus on uh, last mile delivery uh sme or b2b whereas can uh, help us isolate uh, our market expansion as well so so for the early days um 
all investor that we met, uh, especially local Thai investor, they found that we are like super crazy. <laughs> I mean, well, other ones are doing some mobile apps and still suffer. Where on earth you coming to doing some EV and 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 um, no one actually believe in the ideas. So we spend a lot of time and our own money um, to. Prove that um, the product that we made, uh, the customer love it. So we we did a lot of prototypes. So in five years, uh, we have around forties of electric motorcycle in three different models. Um, that's how investor understand. And uh, as uh, a lot of investors say that uh, they love our purpose. Uh, de- design and I think that's key whereas we can compete with the other brands as well um, to focus on the market and, and purpose that we are keen into so when we uh, have decide to go for our last mile delivery so we test and we compete among the other brands and re- the result is we are number one um, so that's make investor understand <laughs> yeah Okay, thanks very much, Earth and Etran. One of the key messages I see here is that when it comes to deep technology, today's technology outsiders may turn into tomorrow's VC darlings. Etran was a bit early, but they were able to pull through for five years, and now they're well on their way with customers, partners, and strong VC interest. At this point, Etran is operating in a crowded sector where there's a lot of investor interest. And as Earth mentioned, Founders should be especially aware of who they're inviting to join their cap table. The value that investors bring is not just in the funding, but also in the operational expertise and in opening their network. Find investors who have been investing for a number of years and partners who have a lot of experience in your industry. That's all the time we have. Thank you to our panel, Navaruna Traya from Plug and Play, Sophia Nador from BP Ventures, Koi Navarro from ADB Ventures, and Doug Parker from Wavemaker Partners. And also a very warm thank you to our showcase solutions, eTran, Green Lion, and Lithium Power. Entrepreneurship is not easy, but you're all on the right track. And for those currently in the grind, I hope today's program has given you more insight to keep on trying. And for those aspiring entrepreneurs, what are you waiting for? Success starts with taking that very first step. Until next time, keep growing, keep innovating, keep resilient.